It's great to see you all this morning here in worship. I want to welcome those of you who are new to our congregation. If you're here for the first time, or the first time in a long time, we're thrilled uh, that you're here. And I want to welcome those watching online as well. Just a quick note, uh, Red mentioned that the, the, Grace, the Gospel and Race Conference we have uh, is coming up soon. And we have some scholarship money available for that. And so if you'd like to come, but... Um, you can't afford the full thing, we'd be happy to offer you some scholarship towards that end. So you can just talk to, uh, see me at the end, see one of our pastors or the welcome table downstairs. We'd love to connect you there. In addition to that, before I get into our text, uh, one of the things we're going to be emphasizing in the coming months is something called missional neighborhood groups. Uh, We want to be a congregation that is intentional about reaching people who don't know Jesus and discipling them in his name. And there are people in your neighborhood, there are people at your workplace, at your school, uh, that we want to equip you to reach. And so whether it's in small group communities or whether you're, whether you're already in a small group community, whether you are leading a group or interested in a group, we're going to have an info session next week to talk about what does it mean to be equipped and to think more intentionally about being missional in our respective neighborhoods. And so Red's going to be leading that after the second and third uh, service. It's going to be at 12 o'clock. Red, how long should this thing be, this info session? hour and a half or so, Um, and so if you want to come to that, uh, feel free to uh, sign up uh, with Red, see Red at the end of the service, he'll be in the lobby area. Now, we're going to have, uh, we're starting a new series today, focusing on the Ten Commandments, how free people live. If you have a Bible, go with me to the book of Exodus chapter 20. My goal as a pastor is is, um, to help teach scripture to you, and one of the things that's very important as we think about the Ten Commandments, is that we actually know what the Ten Commandments are. And so I want to teach you the Ten Commandments. I want to teach you in a way that you'll never forget it, all right? That you'll know the exact order that they go in as well. And it's a very simple way that I've learned in a kids' ministry environment some 16, 17 years ago. It's how to memorize the Ten Commandments on your fingers, okay? This requires participation, uh, so I'm going to need you to participate. There will be a test next week as well. And, uh, And this works great at birthday parties, bar mitzvahs, company any picnics, um, you'll be the star of the show. The first commandment, you shall not have any of the gods before me. Just put one finger up there, just one finger up. With no other gods before me, just one God. Second commandment, you shall not make any graven images. Just put your finger just like that. See that image, how it images that there? You shall not make any graven images. Third is, you shall not take the Lord's name in vain. Take three fingers, just, just put it right over your mouth there, just... <laughs> Watch your mouth, all right? Do not take the Lord's name in vain. The fourth is remember the Sabbath. Turn that into a little pillow right there. Just just take a little nap right there. (laughs) Just remember the Sabbath. Five is honor your father and mother. Just, just, Just salute them right there. Just honor your father and mother. The sixth, you shall not commit any murder. So just take, that's a knife right there, just to your heart. Ah, you shall not commit murder. The seventh is you shall not commit adultery. Just five right there. Put those two, that married couple together, and just split them right down the middle. Oof. You shall not commit adultery. Number eight is you shall not steal. You have five there. You have three there. Just, Just snatch that one right there. You shall not Steal. Number nine, you shall you shall not bear false witness. In the book of Proverbs. Uh, 11, 1, it says the Lord hates false scales. And so this is unbalanced here. And so there's five on one, there's four on the other. You shall not lie, you shall not bear false witness. And find number 10, you shall not covet. Just do this with me. Just do this, you shall not covet. That's their stuff. You know, just uh, keep your hands on your own stuff. There will be a test next week. And so, um, and if you have children, teach your children. They'll never, good kids' ministry stuff right there. All right. Exodus 20. We're going to be in Exodus 20, verses 1 through 3. We're going to focus on the first commandment today, and then we're going to go down the list in the coming weeks. This is going to take us through Lent right up to Easter. 
uh, right in time for the good news of the resurrection. And so Exodus 20, verses 1 through 3, hear the word of the Lord. It says, And God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall have no other gods before me. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, through the power of your Holy Spirit now, give us illumination and revelation. Point, Lord, to the areas of our hearts that you want to transform, the areas you want to heal, the areas you want to redeem, the areas you want to save. Lord, let your word go forth and not come back void. We open our ears to you, Lord, our hearts to you. Open our eyes. We pray these things in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Amen. Many people, most people that you come into contact with have heard or know of the Ten Commandments. It's one of the more famous symbols of faith, famous symbols of the Bible. When you think about symbols in the Bible, we have the symbol of the cross, we have a symbol of the empty tomb, we have a symbol of the dove as the Holy Spirit, fire as the presence of God. And then there's a symbol of tablets, tablets of stone representing the Ten Commandments. Our society knows about the Ten Commandments, and our society has a kind of love-hate relationship with the Ten Commandments. Many people love the Ten Commandments, so much so that Folks want it displayed everywhere, in courthouses, in schools. We, we want it displayed every day. We're not so fixated on doing them, uh, but we want to have them displayed for everyone to see. Now, in a pluralistic society, many people want the Ten Commandments in courthouses and schools and different places because it kind of reminds us of our Judeo-Christian heritage in this country. And in a pluralistic society in which there are many religions, people want kind of the Ten Commandments out there, not because we want to do them necessarily, but because we want to maintain a kind of religious heritage in this country. Some people like the Ten Commandments. Other people don't like the Ten Commandments because it represents what is to them a narrow kind of religiosity. I remember having a conversation or overhearing conversation years ago at a workplace in which coworkers were arguing about religion. And one woman just said, the Ten Commandments are so ancient. You got to keep up with the times. And, And what she was saying with that is the Ten Commandments for her in that moment represented a kind of narrow fundamentalism a kind of narrow religiosity. And so some people love the Ten Commandments. Some people do not like the Ten Commandments because, not because the commandments are bad per se, but because of what it represents. But no matter who you are, we must contend with these commandments. And the most important theological starting point for the Ten Commandments is actually not found within the list is actually found in the context and in the words preceding the list. Prior to giving the Ten Commandments, God's people were slaves for 400 years. Generation after generation were slaves. Great, great grandparents, great grandparents, grandparents, your parents, you were, your children, slaves, generation after generation for four centuries. Think about this for a moment. This is longer than the United States has been in existence. 400 years they were slaves. And to be a slave meant that you had no dignity. To be a slave meant you had no identity. Your body was mistreated. Your body was abused. You were regarded as a piece of property. Your sense of self was stamped out. This is evil beyond evil. And while I'm on this subject, it's important to note, on this Black History Month, that this is not just the legacy of Egypt as found in Scripture. It's one of the ongoing negative legacies of our own country. The first slaves arrived 400 years ago this year. In 1619, 20 African slaves on a Dutch ship in Jamestown, Virginia, 400 
hundred years ago arrived. You cannot understand our country and the fullness of what we've been and who we are without also coming face to face with the reality of our legacy of slavery. For many people, the U.S. has been a place of a promised land. For millions of others, it's been a place of kind of a reincarnation of Egypt. And so you cannot have good conversations about what's happening in our world without taking seriously slavery, whether it was happened with the people of God or whether it happened in this country. And so for four, for four centuries, God's people were slaves. But the good news in the book of Exodus is that God hears their cry. God hears their cry. God comes to their aid. God sends Moses. God gives him a word. God empowers Moses. Moses delivers the people in the power of God through the Red Sea. And after their deliverance from Pharaoh's clutches, God wants to instill into them dignity. After their salvation, God wants to instill to them significance. After their redemption, God wants to instill to them the reason for their liberation. In chapter 19, before the Ten Commandments are given, God says this to Moses, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. This is a group of people that have been slaves for 400 years, identity stamped out. But God says these words, you will be for me a kingdom of priests. The Lord says, I have an identity for you that the world cannot give and the world cannot take away. And so this is the context for the giving of the commandments. You see, God never gives the commandments as a reason for their salvation. He gives the commandments as a result of their salvation. The commandments weren't conditional promises which said, if you do these things... God will deliver you. The commandments were given to them while they were in Egypt. They were not given to them while they're in Egypt. If God said, here's the commandments while you're in Egypt, obey them fully, and after you obey them fully, then I'll deliver you. He doesn't do that. By sheer grace of God, he delivers the people of God, and then after that, gives them the commandments. In the same way, there is nothing you can do to earn the love of God. The commandments were given not to earn the love of God. The commandments were given because the people had already received the love of God. God is now demonstrating his love to them in a new way. You can never get God to love you more than God already loves you. And you can never get God to love you less than God already loves you. God's love is perfect. God's love is steadfast. God's love is not contingent on what you do or do not do. Oh, that's good news, isn't it? No no matter how much you pray, God doesn't say, love you more. Can't find your Bible, God says, I don't love you less. God's love is steadfast. God's love is perfect. You cannot earn the love of God. And so God's grace is at work from the very beginning of the scriptures. There are often people who say the Old Testament is about law. The New Testament is about grace. But that's not true. There's lots of grace in the Old Testament. But what we have in the New Testament is the grace of God fully demonstrated in Jesus Christ. And the New Testament is not law and grace. It's grace and grace beyond grace. Grace as fully demonstrated through Jesus Christ. And so... Beyond being free from Egypt, God was trying to restore something to them. It wasn't enough to be free. The Lord wanted to make them a kingdom of priests. God is saying, I have a new identity for you. I have a new purpose for you. 
I have riches for you. I have a new assignment for you. And to demonstrate all of this to the surrounding world, God gives these commandments. And God is clear. God is firm. God is steadfast because their identity as slaves was so deeply embedded in their bones. They don't know what it's like to be free people. It reminds me of one of my favorite movies, The Shawshank Redemption. In The Shawshank Redemption, there is this man named uh, Brooks, and he's been in jail for 50 years. And when he finds out he's being paroled, he takes a knife to someone's neck, thinking, if I kill this person, I could stay here. I don't have to be released from prison. And so they convince him to put the knife down. He gets out, and this is the scene where he's getting out of the prison. And as he's getting out of the prison, he, he, he does work as a bags groceries in a, a grocery store. Life moves way too fast for him. He's overwhelmed by the changes. He's been out of, he hasn't been out of jail since in 50 years. And he doesn't know how to adjust to the realities of a new world. And, and soon after he leaves the prison, he falls into so much despair, he takes his own life. What happens when we are so used to prison that any notion of freedom feels like bondage? This is Brooks' story. This is the, our story. This is the people of God's story in the scriptures. Over and over in the, in the scriptures, in the book of Exodus, they're so used to Egypt. And they get delivered, and they're in the wilderness, and they say to Moses, Moses, what are we going to eat? You should have just kept us in Egypt. At least we knew when we were going to eat. Over and over again, they're like, what? We, you should have just kept us there. What happens when freedom feels like bondage? And so these commandments are given, when they're given, they're not given as random arbitrary laws. They're given as a means of resistance. They have been formed for 400 years, and now the Lord says to them, I'm going to give you some commandments to help you resist the ways that you have been formed. And the first command that God gives is you shall have no other gods before me. You're different than everyone else. You're different than the surrounding culture. You're different from the surrounding world. You're different from the different religions that find expression. You shall have no other gods before me. And when God says this, God means you shall have no other gods in front of me, alongside me, Instead of me, in conflict with me, behind me, you shall not have any other gods before me. This here is a call for allegiance. God is calling them to allegiance. But this is what I love about this text. The allegiance is not a one-way allegiance. It's not a one-way street. It's an allegiance of mutuality. God doesn't say, be faithful to me, and I'll do whatever I want to you. No, This is the call for mutual allegiance. God is saying, I've already demonstrated my allegiance to you. Now will you demonstrate your allegiance to me? Could you imagine with me for a moment, you're at a wedding. You're at the part of the ceremony where the vows are being exchanged. And the bride goes first and she says, I promise you my exclusive love. I promise you years of fidelity. I promise you unwavering commitment to remain with you. I promise you my absolute loyalty. People will be crying. Father of the bride is just like wiping tears away. People are like, mmm. And then the groom starts speaking. And the groom says, I'm not sure you'll get my exclusive love. I can't promise you undying fidelity. I doubt I'll have an unwavering commitment. You're not going to get my absolute loyalty. The tears will turn to outrage. The crowd will start booing. The pastor will be flabbergasted. Why? Because we want allegiance to be both ways. 
And God doesn't tell the people of God to do what he has not already done for them. He says, I have demonstrated my allegiance to you by rescuing you, rescuing you from Egypt. Now will you show your allegiance to me? If you miss verse 1 and 2, the first commandment can sound like one-sided allegiance of a God who is insecure about his own divinity. And yet, what we see in this command is God already demonstrating his allegiance to the people. God says, I am for you. Will you be for me? And that's the word for us today. God says to each and every one of us in this room, I'm for you. I love you. I'm with you. I've demonstrated myself to you. My allegiance is for you. Now, will you have allegiance towards me? Will you be faithful towards me? Any command that we see is already a gracious response to God's movement towards us. Now, this needed to be said because the people of God were surrounded with gods and idols. There were up to what some say 2,000 gods in Egypt. Egypt had a god for everything, a god for sleeping, a god for eating, a god for farming, a god for the sky, a god for the sun, a god for the moon, a god for rain. They had a god for anything and everything. But it wasn't just something in the past. They were going into a new land now, the promised land of Canaan, and Canaan was not just a land flowing with milk and honey, it was a land flowing with gods and idols. And God said, you just came out of it, but you're entering into new territory, and so you shall have no other gods before me. And yet over and over again, what we see is this revolving door of idolatry with the people of God. There's one... God in particular named Baal. Baal shows, Baal is like this ex-lover who just keeps coming on the scene to ruin a marriage. He just keeps showing up over and over and over again. And Baal gets in the way and the people of God let him in. And then there are times where the people of God go to Baal because Baal was the God of fertility God was the God, Baal was the God of rain. They could not trust that Yahweh would send them rain. And so they would have to go to another God to secure their future. And so we see this revolving door of idolatry, and yet God says, have no other gods before me. Now, here is the challenge. Some of you might be thinking, this has nothing to do with me. And you might come to that conclusion because in our society today, there's not, especially for Christians and non-Christians for that matter, we don't have necessarily classic gods in front of us. Now, some of us came from families, or maybe you have idols in your home, shrines, uh, and, or no people who have that there. And so, for, for, for those, you say, those, that, that's for those folks, but I don't have any shrines in my house. I don't have any gods. In my, what does this have to do with me? Now, what I would say is, in the Old Testament time, people would turn to idols. What we do, however, is we don't turn to idols. What we do is we turn things into idols. We might not turn to it, but we turn things into it. And this is rampant in our lives. John Calvin, the great Reformed theologian, says that our hearts are idol-making factories. Our hearts are idol-making factories. Every one of our hearts. We know how to fashion idols in our hearts. And so we take something in our life that's good and we make something ultimate. I've been helped significantly as I think through idolatry in my own life, as I think about idolatry in the scriptures, by some of the content that a pastor in Manhattan has written. His name is Tim Keller. And in a number of his books, but one book in particular called Counterfeit Gods, he, he names the ways of idolatry and what idolatry is. 
He says, what is, an, what is an idol? It's anything that absorbs your heart and imagination more than God. Anything you seek to give you what only God can give. What is idolatry? Idolatry is not just a failure to obey God. It's a setting of the whole heart on something besides God. What is idolatry? An idol is anything that you turn to and say, save me. Save me from insignificance. Save me from meaninglessness. Save me, save me, save me. And an idol is usually a good thing that we make ultimate. We say, unless we have that, I am nothing. And so in this way, when idolatry is seen in this way, we must guard our hearts. Because although we might not turn to an idol, we know how to turn things into an idol. And for many of us, the list is endless of what we turn into an idol, taking a good thing and making it into an ultimate thing. For some of us, marriage is an idol. Some of us singles in this room, you're saying, I, I just, it's a, marriage is a good thing. You say, I just can't wait to get married. Then all my desires will be f- fulfilled, fulfilled. I want to introduce you to some married people at the end of our service here <laughs> to, to see if that's true. <laughs> marriage can become an idol. Parenting can become an idol. Where everything, everything revolves around your children. Everything revolves around your children. Money can be an idol. A good thing that we make into an ultimate thing. Your appearance can become an idol. A political party can become an idol. Where you say, unless this party is in control, The world is going to be going down, but but if this party gets into control, then everything will be made right. As long as this candidate gets in control and get in power, then everything will be made right. And what we do is we've made something into an ultimate thing. We've made it into an idol. Nationalism is an idol. Financial security can become an idol. It's a good thing. But now your life revolves around it now, and now it becomes an ultimate thing. Church can become an idol. Retirement can become an idol. Sex can become an idol. Money can become an idol. Our hearts are idol-making factories because our hearts can turn anything into an object of worship. And so God says, have no other gods before me. And when God says this, it's not because God is just this uptight, insecure deity. God is saying this because God knows the limitations and the destructiveness of idolatry. God knows that idols promise comfort but offer prison instead. Idols promise comfort. Whether it's idolatry in the form of an addiction, of drugs, where you got comfort, but now you're in prison. The idolatry of comfort that you say, as long as if I had this possession, if I had this achievement, then things would be right with my soul. But then you're, it's this this nonstop thing. You're, You're on this treadmill over and over and over again, and God is grieved because we take good things. And we make them into an ultimate thing. And the ultimate thing, it begins to enslave us. We see this with technology, don't we? There was a study done out of the University of Maryland on young adults and their mobile phones. And I would suggest that this is not just for young adults in our technologically advanced age. This is for everyone now. Before it was like for millennials. And this is for everyone now. But the statistics said in the study was called the young generation is is addicted to mobile phones. And the study had more than 1,000 students from 10 countries around the world to go without any media for 24 hours, and they monitored their feelings. And the study found out that 50% of students failed to go the full 24 hours, and everyone claimed to suffer some kind of withdrawal symptoms. A student at the University of Maryland who participated compared the experience of going without digital technology to missing a limb. He said, I felt something very similar to a phantom limb 
only it would be like a phantom cell phone. One person said, I still felt like my phone was vibrating and I was receiving text messages even though it wasn't on me. <laughs> that ever happened to you? It's like, my leg is vibrating. What just happened there? <laughs> my phone's in the kitchen. It's like, what's, what, what's, what's going on here? That we become so attached to this thing. After 24 hours, they said, what were some of the emotions? What were you feeling? And these are the words that they said. Fretful, confused, anxious, irritable, insecure, nervous, restless, crazy, addicted, panicked, jealous, angry, lonely, dependent, depressed, jittery, and paranoid. At the end of the article, the person who was writing the study said that this generation has become, uh, the cell phones and technology has become this generation's security blanket. When I read that, I said, this is not about security blankets. It's much too tame a phrase. This is idolatry. And I'm the chief sinner here. I'm the chief idol worshiper (laughs) among us here. This is not a security blanket. This is... Idolatry. Idolatry is destructive because it's never enough. But idolatry also has a redemptive component to it. Idolatry is not just something that is destructive, of course it is, but idolatry is revelatory, it reveals something. And what idolatry does is it reveals our deepest longings. Whatever idol we serve, it is a cheap imitation of the deeper longing we all have. It reveals a deeper longing. We worship at the idol of social media because deep down inside, we want connection. We worship at the idol of, at the altar of of political idols because deep down inside, we want a world marked by security. We worship at the the altar of material possessions because deep down inside, we want to be seen. We worship at the altar of sports idols. God, help us. Help me. Because we want to be part of something bigger than ourselves. But it is only God, who can satisfy the deepest longings of our heart. In this respect, idolatry is a cry for help. Idolatry is a cry for rescue. Idolatry is a cry for salvation. It reveals something that only God can satisfy. And so listen, idols take and take and take and take. What we see revealed in the God of the Exodus and fully in the God revealed in Jesus Christ is while idols take and take and take, God and God through Jesus Christ give and give and give. Here's the fundamental difference. Idols take, God gives. And God in the the person of Jesus Christ gives so much. He gives till he can't give anymore. He gives till he dies on the cross. He gives till he takes his last breath. He gives and he gives and he gives while idols take and they take and they take. And so when God says, have no other gods before me, he's not just this uptight God, insecure. He's saying, you will be led down a road of destruction. Because it'll take and take and take. But if you trust in my love, my love gives and gives and gives. The gospel, amen. The good news of the gospel of grace is it reveals of God who gives to the point of death. So that we could be set free. Idols promise comfort, but offer prison instead. Jesus, in his death and resurrection, Jesus, in his love, promises us comfort and grants us freedom for our souls and lives. 
The question is, what's your idol? The issue is not whether we have one or not. The issue is, how many do we have? (laughs) How long is your list? How long is my list? And the more we serve these things, the more they pull from us, take from us, destroy us. And so... In the Old Testament, there was always a smashing of idols and a return to God. How do you smash your idols? Well, minimally, it begins with at least naming them. You can't be free, and I can't be free from that which I refuse to name. If I can't name it, I can't be free from it. This is the power of shame, actually. If you can't name what's held you in bondage, you will remain in bondage over and over and over again. If you can't name that you've made some bad financial decisions or you're in debt, you can't name it. You're going to be repeating it over and over and over and over again. If you can't name the shame that has marked your life, you can't be free from it. The same applies if we can't name the idols that our hearts have been set on, our affections have been set on, our desires have been set on, our hopes have been set on, we cannot be free from it. What's the thing that if you went without it, you have no sense of self, no sense of identity? As we begin to name those things, God begins to set us free. The Israelites believed that other gods would secure for them their future. The first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me, is the way of God saying, that's all a lie. Those gods will never secure your future. Those gods will never give you what you truly want. It's all a lie. And when we begin to name our idols, what we're naming beneath the idols is the lie that we have believed. What's the lie you've believed? about this particular idol? Is it success? Is it money? Is it possessions? Is it achievements? What's the lie you believe that has kept you enslaved? Let's pray together. Idols take and take and take and take. And Jesus Christ gives and gives and gives and gives. <clears throat> gives till he couldn't give anymore. I wonder before we go into worship and singing, can you name the idol? What have you set your affections on in a way that's beyond just joy and delight but you've crossed the line maybe it is financial security maybe it is a relationship that you hope to enter into all good things but have become ultimate things what's the lie that you're believing what's the idol that's been constructed and as we consider that We consider the good news of a God who longs to free us, to be a kingdom of priests. Lord Jesus, now through the power of the Holy Spirit, Lord, zero in on our hearts, zero in in our minds, the things that we have constructed for ourselves, the fears that we live with, the idols that we cling to. Lord, this command was given to us not so we can live in a particular religious order in a way that's just about blind obedience to you and religious observance. Lord, you want to transform our hearts. And so, Lord Jesus, free us, liberate us, 
Lord, help us to begin to name the idols of our hearts, the idols that we have turned into ultimate things. We sing to you now, Lord, words of praise, worship, thanksgiving. You are the God to whom we sing and worship. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand. Let's sing together. hands and multiply God all that I am and find my heart on the altar again set me on fire set me on fire here I am here I am
Let's have our prayer team come to my left, invite those who are going to offer the bread and the cup to come to my right. There's this deeply penetrating verse in the book of Jonah, uh, chapter 2, verse 8, which says, those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. I know, know what it says. God's love is for them. But when we cling to worthless idols, we turn ourselves away from God's love. Some of you might be wondering, what do I, what do, I do with a message like this? And this is what I would invite you to do. Throughout the course of this week, begin to name what are the things that I have taken that's good but made ultimate. And I think there's a part in us that knows when we've crossed that line. When our ever, every waking moment you're thinking about it, you're fantasizing over it. What's the thing that's been ultimate? And the question is, how do you begin to name that first of all? This is what it is, Lord. And then, and, and then ask the Holy Spirit, now what's the lie beneath this? What have I believed that's not true? That, if, that if, if I'm successful, then I'll have an identity? That if I make this amount of money, then I'll be someone? If I achieve, what's the idol? And what's the lie that you've believed? And the Holy Spirit loves to respond to questions like that. And my hope is that this week we can begin to Look to Jesus as the one who satisfies the deepest longings of our souls. Our prayer team is here for whatever need you have. Some of you, you're not even a Christian. You have set your entire life, your affections on something other than God. And God has consistently come to you. Coming to you fully in the person of Jesus Christ. Who gives and gives and gives till he couldn't give anymore so that you could enter into relationship with the living God. And today, it's an opportunity for you to lay down your idols and come to Jesus who loves you with an everlasting love. For some of us, you're, you've been a Christian a very long time, baptized, come to church every Sunday, and like me, you have a long list of idols that need to be named. The lies need to be exposed. We need to lay them down and allow Jesus and his love to replace the places that have been dominating our hearts and minds. One of the ways that we get breakthrough is through prayer. Spiritual breakthrough is about the ongoing work of spiritual formation, all the things I just uh, highlighted to you. But breakthrough is also about moments of encounter with the living God. That's why we pray for each other, because we believe when we pray for one another, God can break shackles off of us in the name of Jesus. And so whether you're coming for prayer, whether you're coming for the bread and the cup, as the Lord leads you, feel free to respond. As we close, let me invite you to open your hands towards heaven. This is a posture of receiving. If you're new to our church, this is also a posture of of letting go letting go of the idols we have clung to. And so may this be a posture that expresses the desires of our hearts. And may God set us free. With your hands and your hearts in a posture of receiving, brothers and sisters, sons and daughters of the living God, may the Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face to shine upon you and fill you with peace. And may you walk out of this building in the power of the Holy Spirit experiencing the freedom that only comes through Jesus Christ. And may you walk out of this building in the power of the Spirit, letting go of every idol and the lie that you've believed and living in the truth of God's love for you. I bless you all in the strong, in the beautiful, in the liberating name of Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Grace and peace to you all.